I'm the chair for the Perineal Dialysis University in uh, Tampa Bay. It's with Wake Forest University, John Burkhart. I'm also co-chair with John Crabtree for ISPD for global standardization of PD catheter uh, techniques. So this is actually a topic uh, Adrian Fine was my mentor going through. He scared me quite a lot, but the topics we would bring up were about PD catheters and why we aren't using PD catheters for patients with heart failure and ascites related to uh, cirrhosis and malignancy. And I've taken that on. It's something that's little literature out there, and I want to present what I have and what little information is out there to try and make you think about this as a possibility. So non-traditional use of perineal dialysis catheters. I have the patient on the side has nothing to do with this, but this is one of our patients who's out fishing, and that's how he does his PD exchanges. <laughs> so non-traditional use of perineal dialysis catheters. Um, I will go through the outline just basically of heart failure, uh, cardiorenal syndrome and what it means to us today, uh, treatments, traditional and non-traditional uses of diuretics and so on, uh, PD catheters, ascites with cirrhosis and the management of these patients. Uh, I'll also talk about malignant ascites and probably one of the biggest impacts we have for patients' uh, quality of life. And at the end, if we have time, I'd like to show a video. Most of you haven't seen a video of a PD catheter being placed in a patient who's got cirrhosis. So Mr. Jones, all these cases are true cases that we have. Uh, Mr. Jones is a 59-year-old gentleman, type 2 diabetes, with all the complications of diabetes. Uh, he's legally blind, nephropathy, extensive heart history. The guy has a heart attack every couple of weeks. He's had four stents. He's had pacemakers put in. His EF is 17%, and admissions, two admissions, usually he's in for one to two weeks for IV diuretics and then discharged out. So this time around, June 20th or 10th, was admitted with heart failure. And despite IV Lasix, the patient remained in heart failure. Uh, nephrology was consulted with cardiorenal syndrome, just to say that it, that's what it was. They weren't looking at a PD catheter as the treatment. Uh, they were really looking at hemodialysis for the patient. We talked about the case. Uh, surgery didn't want to put anything in because these patients are such high risk. So I ended up putting a PD catheter in for the patient on a local anesthetic. It's very simple to do, uh, small complications. So this is what he looks like. On presentation, after one week of IV diuretics, and that was a couple of days later after we put the PD catheter in. So we used the catheter right away. I don't have leaks. Uh, we used icodextran overnight, kept on doing this, ultrafiltration with the patient. Next day, we ended up increasing the exchanges to, for further uh, fluid removal. Patient was converted over to cycler, very easy to do, and then during the day, we'd have icodextran. Patient's wife was treated, uh, or trained, sorry, and it takes really not that long to, t to treat her train these patients, and he's discharged home. So pertinent points over the next six months, no hospitalizations. Remember, this guy was being in every week for a couple of days and then being discharged out. Now it's no hospitalizations for anything. Uh, his visits with nephrology and heart failure were planned together. New York Heart Association classifications, his functionality improved by two. So he was lying flat in bed, that was all he could do, and now he's walking blocks with his wife, his quality of life markers were obviously improved and no complications such as a peritonitis or a leak. So heart failure associated with renal disease. No matter what the cause of the heart failure, whether it's ischemic, diabetic, uh, infiltrative, uh, valvular, arrhythmias, these patients all have a high mortality. So one month, one year, or five years, their risk of uh, mortality is extensive, 11, 28, and 59%. Now on top of that, if you put renal disease on this, it increases the risk even more. So there's a study that looked over 80,000 patients, hospitalized or not, who had some degree of heart failure. And in reviewing these patients, over 60% of them had some degree of renal impairment. 30% uh, had moderate to severe, which was an injection fraction, or uh, EGFR of about 55 milliliters per minute. And looking at their mortality for these patients after one year follow-up, 24% who had no renal disease uh, had mortality of, sorry, 24%. And those who had mild had 38 and patients who had significant renal disease had a 51% increase in mortality. So that's taken that as a marker. Patients with renal disease and heart failure have a significant mortality risk. Taking it in other ways, if you have their uh, EGFR down by 10 for any markers for them, their mortality for a year is 15%. So Ronco was one of the first to coin the term cardiorenal syndrome. Uh, and there was lots of confusion, and still remains a lot of confusion into this. In 2008, they tried to subclassify it into five, which I don't think probably helped it out too much, but just giving the Coles notes of what it means. Uh, so acute myocardial infarct causes hypotension, patient develops 
uh, acute kidney injury. Type two is the ones that we actually get referred for these patients, and they're the ones who have chronic heart failure, uh, chronic hypotension, hypofusion of the kidneys, the patients have chronic uh, kidney disease from that point. Type three is the acute kidney injury, patients are uh, volume overloaded, hyperkalemic acidosis, uremia, which all have uh, stunting of the cardiac function. Four is chronic GNs, the patients have hypertension, volume overload, causes issues with the patients. Either they have uh, LVH or they can have pulmonary hypertension, right-sided failure, and so on. And five is the most simple way of looking at it is patients who have sepsis and multi-system failure. Again, acute kidney injury, type three, where the patients are hyperkalemic, volume overload, acidosis, and so on. But what we'll be focusing on is just the type two. So this is the simplest way of looking at it. Uh, for whatever cause, the patients have a decrease in their cardiac output. And what the patients end up doing is their sympathetic drive then is activated, causing their renin aldosterone system to be activated, causing them to have sodium and fluid overload. And the hope is, again, making this simplest way, the Frank Starling curve is shifted to the right to try and compensate increasing output. But over a period of time, the heart just continues to decompensate, can't manage, and patients go into volume overload, no matter what you do. So the treatment options that we look at, I've just listed the ones that either have a morbidity or mortality uh, benefit. And these are pretty straightforward. Sodium fluid restrictions, diuretics, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, hydralazine, uh, spironolactone or aldosterone receptor blockers, especially with the RAIL study, patients with New York classification three or four have benefits. ICD. Uh, now, I put in ultrafiltration, which is probably the easiest and interesting thing about it. Cardiologists in the early 2000s were thinking that if they could use these small little machines called acrophoresis machines, they could take off volume for these patients. Decreasing the amount of volume that patients has decreases their uh, afterload, improving cardiac output, improves your sympathetic drive or decreasing it, decreasing your drive for sodium and fluid, and overall hyperperfusion, improving the kidneys perfusion and, and diuretic response. That was the hope. And so people started using this uh, for patients who were deemed diuretic resistant. And in 2004, 2005, they had rapid and unload, which looked at two arms of patients either being on acrophoresis or with diuretics. And their findings were significant. So patients who had the acrophoresis machine, which just took off fluid, doesn't have anything to do with acidosis or hyperkalemia, that these patients had a definite benefit of being on this machine versus diuretics. Decreased hospitalizations, decreasing the amount of time the patients were in hospital, fluid removal, and really no complications. The downside of the studies was the fact that these patients weren't really aggressively diuretic uh, responsive. So they weren't being given IV diuretics. There were no loads or meaning goals for fluid removal for them. So it wasn't what you would have in our hospital where we'd be giving them IV Lasix and a stepwise algorithm of uh, increasing for fluid removals, adding on metals and so on. Uh, and the patients also weren't that ill. Their renal functions were mild, if anything, of impairment. Uh, in any event, CRESS came around in 2012, and what they did was they had about 188 patients on. One arm was going to be the diuretics, and they had an algorithm stepwise intensified the amount of treatment the patients got, as well as the fluid removal that they would have. On the other arm, they had the acrophoresis machine. And these patients had moderate to severe renal impairment. And at the end of the study, what they found was there were significant adverse effects for these patients with no benefit of fluid removal. So the patients had worsening of the renal function, and also they had complications almost directly related to their peripheral lines. So they had bleeding, uh, thrombocytopenia, anemia, and sepsis. So at the end of the day, these patients were, uh, if anything, harmed by aquaphoresis, and we really don't know what to do with the machines now. Uh, our own center hasn't used it for two to three years. They're expensive, they're about $15,000. The, the uh, filters are about $1,000 per treatment, so we don't use it. And I think everyone else is kind of on the same plan as what to do with these things. So in our group, refractory heart failure, uh, if you look at these patients for mortality benefit, I, I can't tell you that P is gonna do anything for the patients in mortality. Uh, the patients are already quite ill. If you've got a patient who is IV diuretic resistant, their mortality over six months is about 50%, and over a year it's 75 to 80% mortality. So you're really not gonna see much in the way of this. And that's what the studies more or less show. Patients who were traditionally treated with diuretics versus a PD catheter, there's no difference in mortality. Comparison of hemodialysis versus PD, the same thing. On the other hand, hospital admissions, there's a significant find. In all studies that you look at for patients who are diuretic resistant placed on PD catheters, they will have a decrease in their hospitalizations, and those patients that are actually admitted to hospital have a decrease in the time that they're in hospital. Quality of life, functional status. Uh, so patients who are put on perineal dialysis, again, 
uh, Bertoli, Koch, Kunin, and Sanchez looked at these patients, and all the studies show the same thing. After a period of three, six months, nine months to a year from their baseline, patients all had an improvement in their functionality of at least one, if not two. Quality of life, Sanchez took on this, and this is health-related quality of life markers, so mortal or mobilities, dressing, pain, depression, anxiety, all these markers improved over the six months, which again makes sense for these patients. Our group, including my wife, who's a uh, cardiologist in Winnipeg, took on 10 patients who had significant heart failure, uh, New York classification three, CKD three or four, and these were non-transplant patients. They were all quite ill. They put PD catheters in. And at the end of the day for these patients, it showed improved clinical status, reduced hospitalization, reduced lengths of stay, and minimal complications such as the leaks or peritonitis compared to the traditional. In this uh, refractory congestive heart failure systematic review, 21 studies looking over 600 patients. This is the one that probably most people will quote. Decline in hospitalization is significant. Ejection fraction improved, so they took the patients pre and post PD catheters and found that their ejection fraction was at least 4% improved. Uh, New York heart close classification of at one, not one and a half. Uh, no change in renal function, no impact to mortality, and at the end, yearly peritonitis rate was that of standard PD. So it's easy for us for most of these patients when we ask to put in a PD catheter for ultrafiltration. The majority of them still have significant renal function and don't require renal replacement therapy. So I put in a PD catheter, uh, we'll put in one and a half liters, put in overnight for icodextran, and, and we UF them. And we continually do that, and the patients will respond. We, as a group, and I'll keep saying this, we don't have complications such as the leaks. Uh, it's comparable to anything else. Now, with the video, you'll be able to see how our technique is. If the patients do require renal replacement therapy, you treat them just like traditional. So it's easy to do. We have quite a system in place. And if the patients are going home, we also have assisted PD if they don't have other supports to be able to do this. So benefits, well-tolerated, uh, slow correction of volume and electrolytes compared to hemodialysis, which itself has evidence of stunning the myocardium because you're taking four hours to take off four to five liters. Uh, the patients are always suffering some sort of uh, hypotension. Perform at home, easy access to supplies and equipment. Patient empowerment, patients love the fact that they don't have to rely on other people to be able to train themselves or teach themselves to be able to take off fluid. Impact of the programs, hospitalization, low cost for supplies and supports, and low complication rates from all studies that look at this. Now we come to a little bit more bizarre things, and I'm asked all the time to put PD catheters in patients with uh, ascites related to cirrhosis. Uh, surgeons will not touch these patients. So Mr. T, another patient, if you look at him on the one side here, that's 40 liters in his belly. So this guy is literally sitting up. He's peeking over his belly. His angle of his body is like that. That's how full his belly is. So he's a 65 cirrhotic uh, alcohol truck driver, no longer drinking, hypertensive, CKD3, uh, ejection for uh, SMA GFR of 25 to 30. So he was referred to us. Uh, I would put a, a needle in and drain him probably 20 liters every other week, taking off fluid. That's what he could manage. His pressure's never dropped. We give him albumin during that time. I uh, refused all other management for it. Finally, at the point where the guy couldn't eat anymore, couldn't wear clothes, uh, couldn't mobilize, he was agreeable to this. And again, the surgeons were approached and they said, absolutely not, you know, he'll leak from this. I told him that uh, he'd be the most challenging case that we would do and that he did have a, a risk of leak, which would be uh, horrible for him because I wouldn't be able to close it up if it continued to tear around his rectus muscle. So we put it in. We drained them there. You can see from that point to there, this is my place in catheter. This is him three days later. So that's 40 plus liters taken out of his belly. We gave him a ton of albumin, a ton. And he had no clothes, so I'm, I'm not making this up. I keep saying this. This is his wife's Lululemon pants that he's wearing. And he signed himself out against medical advice. He was eating burgers. He was loving life. And to this day, he's still alive. That's three and a half years later. So his cores, uh, weekly drains, three to four. He's He's a funny guy. He's non-compliant with any of the stuff that I do to him, so he drains himself. Uh, his main complication is he developed an umbilical hernia, and the surgeons would not operate him because they're worried that he's going to bleed. As soon as you open him up, their, their worst nightmare is to have a leak and a bleed going on. Finally, after the, I think he was in for five admissions, they finally, the surgeon repaired it, and he's still good to go to this day. So cirrhotics, main complication after 10 years, Main causes, hepatitis C, NASH, alcoholic liver disease. Mortality, 
cirrhotic, uh, so cirrhosis with ascites, 50% over two years. If the patients become refractory from medications, their mortality is much, much increased by about 50% over one year. Uh, main complaints, as you'd expect, uh, distension, anorexia, dyspnea, and myalgia. So these patients get the cramps, and they're not really sure why they get the leg cramps, whether it's from intravascular shifts, fluid shifts that they have from medications, and it's quite difficult to treat them. Again, this is the Cole's notes of cirrhotics, and everybody has a different opinion. Of portal hypertension, production of vasodilators, nitrous oxide is one of them. Uh, you've got sympathetic and sphagnic vasodilation, activation of the sympathetic nervous system. You end up getting renin aldosterone system activation, sodium and fluid. You end up getting intravascular volume overload in ascites. That's the main pathway of how that develops. It's a hyperaldosterone state. So treatment options for these patients, 95, 90 to 95 percent of the patients will respond to the usual uh, treatment. Sodium restriction, less than 90 millimoles per day. This is one of the hardest that the patients will have. That if you have a patient who's not responding, the majority of them are not uh, adhering to their diet. Diuretic spironolactone makes the most sense because they're a hyperaldosterone state, and less so furosemide for treatment. So refractory ascites prevalence is 5 to 10 percent of the population. Uh, survival over 50% one year, as I stated before. And refractory ascites are those patients who reaccumulate after starting uh, their sodium restrictions. And again, this is probably part non-compliance. Uh, lack of response over four days. Complications due to the diuretics, hyper hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, gynecomastia, intravascular volume, uh, hypotension. Persistent ascites despite sodium restrictions. Large volume paracentesis is the first management for these patients. Uh, it's been shown for decreasing hospitalization and complications for patients is minimal. Uh, no difference in mortality compared to diuretics. TIPS is the only intervention that's been shown a mortality benefit for these patients. And basically what the TIPS procedure is, radiology is asked to place a connection through the right internal jugular through the portal vein into the hepatic vein to decrease the resistance to try and get a forward flow for the patients. Shown benefit for quality of life, uh, as well, it's uh, more effective than uh, large volume paracentesis for ascites. The downside is that for patients, there's contraindications depending on what their development is, how severe their liver disease is. Uh, if they're greater than 60 years of age, there's contraindications. And because of the fact that you're putting volume into their system, if they have uh, decompensated heart, you're going to put them into failure. So they're also uh, not able to have the procedure. These are the patients that we end up getting referred to nephrology to place a PD catheter. So mortality, numbers are small. People will try and tell you, and I'm, I'm not selling you on PD for a mortality benefit uh, for these patients. It's, it's, they do comparisons between the group. Dovecki's group is the largest with 21 versus 41, and they said that there was no difference in the outcome. If you actually look at the graphs, it's not significant, but it looks like it's on the trend that mortality is higher. And that's what you expect. A patient with cirrhosis is going to have a higher mortality compared to an IG and a property patient who has no other issues on board. Nutritional status, uh, again, all these patients are going to be malnourished. They're spilling out protein like crazy. Uh, it, some will say to you that by doing perineal dialysis that you're improving their nutritional status. You're removing their uremia, and over a period of time, their albumin will plateau off. Uh, these are all high transporters. The main fact is because of the hydrostatic pressure in their systems and their low oncotic pressures, they're spilling out everything. It's not really about the membrane characteristics themselves that's causing this. So Morrow asked me this. He said, it's crazy to be putting PD catheters. People ask me this all the time. So we give presentations uh, on doing PD catheters for these patients. And we know that they're at a high risk of, of infections. All these patients end up having gram negatives. Usually E. coli is 30, well, 75% of them. And the rest are going to be a, a gram positive. Patients who have cirrhosis have bacterial overgrowth. They have a higher risk of having a translocation of the bacteria through the lymphatic system or transmural migration of bacteria into the perineum. And you'd think putting a PD catheter in these patients it would actually worsen their, their, their case. An actual fact, and the majority of evidence is out there, is that patients have a decrease or a comparable peritonitis rate versus the traditional. So Trow's one of the group from Hong Kong, and they're the largest studying at this. And their comparison is the same. So patients who had hepatitis uh, B with cirrhosis versus hepatitis B not with cirrhosis on perineal dialysis, similar outcomes. The uh, streptococcus was the main cause of their peritonitis versus gram negatives. And the belief is that by using lactulose, you're getting rid of the 
of bacteria by the load, emptying out their bowels. That's one thing. Second is that you're improving their nutrition. By improving their nutrition, their immunity is improved. Probably another one which is probably not as likely as the inflammatory mediators are removed, which also have a direct effect on your immune system. <coughs> so hypotension, uh, postparasyntesis, uh, we get asked this all the time. And what it, this actually means is that by taking out the volume, you're activating your sympathetic uh, system, your renin. You're actually having a multi-system failure. Acute kidney is one of the major issues for these patients. Uh, the studies will show you that if you're doing paracentesis, patients under the four, five liters, you're not really at the risk of it. Over five liters, majority of patients will have this issue. And that's where it comes into talking about how do you protect these patients. And albumin is truly the only thing out there at the present time that's shown any evidence for protecting patients from hypotension. Uh, Ginn's study looked at patients' albumin getting 10 grams per liter versus placebo, and they had a 3.8% versus 21% for acute kidney injury. The unfortunate part of this study, and this is the one that most people will quote, is that one third of the patients weren't actually receiving regular diuretics. So it's not, it's difficult to be able to tease out what that really means to us. Uh, Bernardi's group did a meta-analysis, 16 randomized trials, it's about 1,200 patients, and compared to all others, the starches, pentaspan, IV fluids, octreotide, albumin was the only one to show mortality benefit in these patients. The difference between four, six, eight, or 10 grams, there's no difference in outcome for the studies that are out there. And at the end of the day, American Association for Studying the Liver Disease recommends if you're going to use a paracentesis of five liters or greater that you should be giving them six to eight grams per liter of, of fluid that you take off. And that's what we do in our practice. Leakage and bleeding risk, nobody talks about it. Go through the literature, no one talks about it. There's never any mention of it. Uh, the only thing I could find was Devecki said that their outcomes were similar to the traditional uh, and bleeding risk, low risk. You'd think that these patients would bleed a lot, but from their literature, there's nothing, and from our experience, as I explained, there's not much. So we've had 14 patients for cirrhosis, uh, for ascites drains, 100% demonstrated some degree of renal disease. We had two patients that were on hemodialysis that would require uh, tapping all the time, and so I placed catheters in them. Meantime, from the time the catheter was placed, the patient dying was about four months. We had no bleeds, we had one leak, uh, and two paranized rates with one patient. So absolute contraindications, DIC, cellulitis, these are all common sense. Uh, confirmed peritonitis. If the patient is still drinking, don't put the catheter in. I'm just saying that to you now. So all of our peritonitis rates was this crazy guy, that, I shouldn't say that, but. <laughs> so he swore to me that he wasn't drinking anymore. And uh, I put a PD catheter in him. He went home and then we got a call that he was running around his place spraying his carpet, his things. I'm not making this up. So we ended up bringing him back in, uh, had him there for a couple of days, and then he said he wouldn't drink anymore. And then we sent him out again and we got the same phone call. He was spraying his carpet, his lo Yeah, so don't do it, because the, the surgeons <laughs> will never, they won't, as soon as they find out you put a catheter in this guy, they say this is your issue. So it's, it's, yeah. So questionable contraindications, we have put PD catheters in patients with INRs greater than two. Uh, platelets, I have not myself done it for uh, 40 or less. Umbilical and inguinal and scrotal hernias. The whole idea is that the patients have developed this because the amount of fluid that they have in, if you're taking the volume out, they're going to improve, at least not worsen. And the pleural effusions, especially for the rights, this is where the patients have it. And anyone that has experience with PD, uh, the patients usually will develop a, a pleural effusion on the right. There's some sort of congenital or they've had a tear in, into their uh, pleural space. And by taking the fluid out, these patients will respond. You're not gonna get a thoracic surgeon to fix this. And if you put in uh, sclerotic, basically any agent to try and sclerose this area, it's painful, it's very inefficient, uh, and at the end of the day, you're, you're gonna harm them. So we just take the fluid and they have no problems. Malignant ascites. So this is probably, and I say this all the time, this is the biggest impact that we've had in quality of life for these patients. So Mrs. J, a sweetheart, she's a lady that unfortunately had ovarian CA, metastatic liver, uh, perineum, of course complicated with ascites, requiring paracentesis. So these patients, in Winnipeg at least, in Manitoba, we don't have a regular system where patients can get tapped. So they have to go to the emergency department or to a clinic if somebody's willing to. She will sit there for eight hours because she's deemed non-urgent. And that's where they sit. So she doesn't have long to live, so the family sits there. They're all frustrated with what's happening. So you can see this bag that she has on the side there. They've tapped her on the side over and over again. She's developed a leak there. 
and she's got a bag on the other side from a leak on the other side. And that's how she would lie in bed with these bags, these ostomy bags to collect the fluid. So I'm not a surgeon, my sutures look like shoelaces, but I was able to de basically take the fluid out, take out what she had there, do it, put in a suture which is nothing, and that's how she ended up being like that. So course, PD catheter placed under ultrasound thoroscopy. We train the family. It takes you an hour and a half to show them. Because you're not showing them anything other. You're not doing them doing PD. You're just showing them sterile technique. It's very easy to do. Uh, we supply the cost. Everybody was complaining about the cost. A bag is a buck fifty. I'll pay you the buck fifty. That's what it is. So they're going to use two bags a week. Who cares? Versus them coming into emerge, sitting there for eight hours. It, it's a no-brainer. So she had one episode of exit site infection, fifth generation cephalospore, and she survived six months, but never had to go back into a merge. So that's a quality of life. <laughs> Thanks. So represents seven to 10 percent. The rest are all cirrhotics. Uh, survival is one to four months. The majority of these patients who present never even knew they had cancer until they came in because of their increasing girth. Uh, symptoms of abdominal swelling, pain, nausea, anorexia, and vomiting, all from the fluid that they have in their, in their bellies. Causes the majority are ovarian, uh, GI, liver, pancreatic, breast, lymphoma. And the causes, the main types is basically you get spread into their perineum. It uh, disrupts their lymphatic drainage. They get ascites. You also get cells that will create acidic fluid by itself. You can have them where encroaches onto the liver, they get cirrhosis or they get portal hypertension. And the most uncommon is a secondary bud chiari where it just impacts the liver, hepatic uh, vein, and they have backfill. So treatment options, diuretics, there are no randomized controlled trials looking at this. Uh, and the majority of physicians who are using this don't believe it actually works. The Denver shunt, which is basically a shunt that's directing fluid from the perineum into the IJ, nobody ever does this anymore. Majority don't because of the complications, DIC infections, they get uh, SVC syndrome or clotting through it. Paracentesis has been shown to be the most beneficial for these patients. They usually get it once every two to three weeks of taking volume off. Uh, large volume removal does not require the same colloid replacement, and I'm not sure why that is. They just don't have the same activation of their system. Infection rates. Compared to the cirrhotics, these patients do not have the same risk of developing an infection. If they are, they're more or less case reports. Uh, small number of studies, but again, it seems to be quite safe for these patients to have a PD catheter place. Long-term function, whether it's a double cuff uh, PD catheter or a Plurex, their uh, functionality is long-term compared to the pigtail catheters, which is much smaller in caliber. You end up getting gummed up. You end up having a lot of these catheters not working after a couple of weeks. Matatoma experience, our, our number is actually higher than this. I just presented this. Uh, anyways, but our, we've had one peritonitis, two exit uh, infections, no leaks, no need for reposition, visceral punctures or uh, bleeds. Average time to death is three months. So quality of life is really the benefits we say. Over and over again, quality of life for these patients. Decreased number of procedures because every time the patient comes in, they're getting poked. And every time they get poked, there's complication risk for it. Family healthcare nurses can be trained and decrease in the healthcare itself. So overall conclusions, we really need to have larger numbers to, to tease out what benefits these patients have, and that's what we're actually doing now, uh, comparing for the GI guys tapping their patients versus our uh, patient numbers. Obvious resource and cost benefit re reduces invasive procedures for the patients. Hospitalization, comparable risks, and quality of life is the big factor. So if you don't mind, I'm going to show you the video. I hope I have enough time for this. This is, so this is a gentleman who's got about 30 liters in his belly. Uh, and he's presented over and over again to the hospital for tapping. And he's agreed to this. So this is Sarah Dunsmore that's doing the procedure while I film with a, so it's a double cuff catheter. And as you can see, if anybody's ever watched catheters being placed, we map out everything. Everybody gets mapped because at the point is the coiled catheter there, if you don't do it properly, once that patient has all the fluid out, that tip is going to be right on their perineum, which is extremely painful. And everybody that knows PD will say about point pain. So we measure out the first cuff. We do it through the paramedian aspect. And she's trying to make it in such a way that the, the catheter, again, you have to appreciate he's going to lose 30 liters 
in four or five days, and that cuff is going to be loose. So we do everything, map it out, make sure that we give enough room so that the cuff does not migrate out. Everybody gets lidocaine. We don't use any sedation for the patients. And the lidocaine, we give bicarb, so the bicarb takes away a bit of the sting. Using a Kelly's. These procedures, every patient that we have ends up having ultrasound beforehand. Uh, we usually do it throughout the whole thing, but this patient had such uh, a large amount of fluid we use it. That's a cautery gun that I got from the States, 10 bucks. <laughs> and that's a Varys needle. And this is the game changer for us. It's basically a spring load and it allows for fluid to come through. If it comes near anything, it, the doll part comes out. So it's going to have three clicks that you'll be able to appreciate. First click is going through the anterior part of the rectus muscle. One. Posterior rectus, rectus muscle. Two, I'm now in the preparatal space. I'm going into the perineum, and I use an IV saline now see at full flow. And that's how we show patients or people in Mexico, Colombia, and so on, how you can do this with ultrasound or fluoroscopy to be able to place a PD catheter. And that's what we're doing here. So she's taken out the second stage of the various needle. This is what the surgeons use when they're doing laparoscopic procedures using a wire. Again, in Mexico, uh, Baxter supplies all of this stuff for them. So that's all they have when a patient presents in their emergency departments. They have this. And so all these patients go on to PD through the eMERGE. The wire that places down, we put it down to about 20 five centimeters in, any longer than that, the patient will say they feel something in their rectum and it's uncomfortable. And again, we're not using sedation. We use an eight French dilator just to be able to open it up and we do serial dilations going through the rectus muscle. I used to do it through the linea elba, but I ended up having so many leaks because the linea elba wouldn't grasp around the catheter well enough, especially with these patients who are worried about it. So I was very fortunate to have Sarah join a group. She, there she is. She's a very nice person. <laughs> and again, you don't have to put that all the way down. Uh, this guy had so much. So that places down now into the belly. But if you're a 90-year-old, you know, 70 kilogram lady, you're not going to do that. This is the catheter, the stylet. Uh, we have different ways of showing people how to do it. You can do it with a stylet. You can do it with a wire. Um, that's the acidic fluid. You can see if we just left that alone, it would just spray out. And now she's going to basically push this down. And as she's pushing it down, she's removing the wire at the top. You just don't appreciate that part. You have to explain that to people that you don't advance the whole wire. So now she's dropped it all the way down. We're pulling back the peel away sheath. And you can see that deep cuff that she has there. And what we do is we basically take the deep cuff and we make a little purchase around the rectus muscle so that it sits in the rectus muscle itself. We've already ultrasounded the rectus muscle to know that we have enough tissue there without tearing through it. Because if you tear through it, that's not a good thing. So now we're correcting, making sure that this patient's PD catheter is going to drain properly, that there's no kinks, and that's just the ascites fluid going through there. And you can see that there's no leakage around the catheter itself. Now we're freezing the tunneling itself. And a lot of this stuff is from what I learned with uh, Sunit Singh here, as well as with Dr. Crabtree. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been a long process, but it's a completely different product than what we originally started doing. So this is called a Fowler stylet, and it's extremely sharp, and it tunnels through. It's the same size as the actual catheter itself, so there's no room for the catheter to move around. You'll get a lot of times where the surgeons will use their scalpel and open up the exit site there. And that ends up being a problem because the catheter then shifts back and forth like a piston. So this is extremely tight, the side that you see. And we've given it enough distance to the cuff will be about three to four centimeters away from the exit site, so you don't have migration of the catheter. If the patient's going to leak, it's not going to be from the external cuff, it's going to be from the deep cuff, and we make sure that we encincture it extremely tight. 
in our program now we have four nephrologists that have been trained to do acute catheters and we're able to put acute catheters in most days when they present with acute kidney injury or need a catheter now. And you can see at the top, she's making sure that the cuff is well placed in the rectus muscle. almost done. Now we check to make sure that the catheter has no kinks along the path itself. It's still going to drain properly. If there is no flow, you know that you've kinked the catheter from the point of the insertion. And this is the last. It's a 1-0 monocryl. It's a dissolvable suture that she's going into the rectus muscle around the catheter. You can't break this off in your hand. So it's extremely tight. You'll see that she's putting in a double knot and it's tight. So as she's doing this, the catheter is still going to make sure that we haven't compromised the catheter, that it's not kinked off, but that's tight. You will not have to do that. <laughs> Questions? So, hi, so that was fantastic. Um, so I put in PD catheters, uh, Daniel Schwartz, and uh, I do get leaks on occasion, uh, not very often, but Often enough that the more intraperitoneal fluid there is from ascites, the more I would worry. Yeah. You go paramedian and not through the linea alba, which is yeah. interesting to me. The reason I hadn't done that was because of concerns around good anesthesia and bleed risk. How do you manage that? So remember when we first met, I was doing the yeah. same as you, linea yeah. alba, because uh, less innervation, less risk of bleeds, uh, and at the time I thought there would be no leaks. But as we're doing these patients who've got these huge bellies like that, I've only got so much leeway from your umbilicus to the point. And I was using umbilicus more and more for a landmark, which actually threw me off, made the catheters more painful. So Crabtree said, you know what, just go ahead and do the other side, freeze them and see what happens. And I used an ultrasound, so you're looking at your inferior uh, epigastric arteries. That's where the one that you're going to nick. And it's very simple to see. The majority of people will say to you, if you come near it, it rolls away from the catheter anyways. We've had, I've got a picture where I nicked one, and it, it was uh, one minute you turn your back and it, that, it's there, it's a huge mound. <laughs> and, uh, but I have really the, the leak. So the second part of the question is about the leaking itself. We drain them for about five liters right there, or more. We're giving them albumin beforehand, especially if we've seen them, so that it decompresses their abdomens. And at that point, we then start doing the sutures. If you don't do that, you don't have much leeway, and the muscles are so tense that once you've taken it out, the sutures are no longer as secure, as tight as what you'd want. And we, we truly haven't had any leaks. And the other part is to make sure you do the purchase in the rectus muscle, because what I would do before was just leave it on top of the rectus muscle, but then you'd have a leak around that. And I have had leaks before. It's just every time I do it, we try and change the practice mm -hmm. so that it doesn't happen like that. Okay, great, thanks. Hi, Dave Patel. Um, you presented two very distinct scenarios, one of a cardiorenal syndrome and one of uh, simple drainage of ascites. Now, where we've often been asked to get involved is someone who has a combination of decompensated right-sided failure, um, had a congestion and development of ascites with need for both drainage of ascites as well as ultrafiltration or dialysis. Right. So I guess the challenge in that case is the ascites is always going to produce itself. And can you realistically put in fluid and achieve some degree of realistic ultrafiltration or clearance right. with that ascites there? So that's a good question. Uh, that question is the same as for patients who have cirrhosis, who have ascites who need renal replacement therapy. So what you can do, and what you're going to do, is basically do large volume paracentesis. You're going to take the fluid down. And no matter what, if they're fluid restricted and they're watching, the accumulation of their ascites does not come back that quickly. On top of that, you're going to be using an ultrafiltration goal for these patients. So if I put in, let's say, two liters into their abdomen for renal replacement therapy, and as well as ultrafiltration, I'm going to be taking off 25, 25, uh, yeah, 250 mLs for the time. So I'm ultrafiltrating them for 500 cc's. Over that period of time, you're going to be able to get them down, and you're not going to be just worrying about them continually increasing their volume. You're going to have them at a negative fluid balance. Uh, 
For the patients with the cirrhosis, on the other hand, you have to worry about them due to the fact that they do suffer from hypotension and chronically, and you put worse in their conditions. So you truly have to have a goal. If I'm taking off, sorry, if I'm looking at taking uh, 300 cc's off, it's going to be a 2300, and you have to stay with that. Even if they still have fluid in, you have to clamp them off and look at the next exchange for them, because otherwise you're going to cause too much of a fluid shift for them. Does that make sense? They're going to be fluid negative, and they're not. Like, it, it just physiologically, they can't have that much fluid. If you're taking them as fluid negatives and they're following a fluid restricted diet, at some point you're going to have them empty here. They're not going to always have that things because your volume here. Just think of it as two to three liters that you and I would be able to hold in that time period. Yeah, it, it just takes time, right? It's right. Dealing with uh, again, it's it's about dollars versus the the, the end customer, right? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, patience is probably the part of it. My wife doesn't have much of that, but I get it. <laughs> Shauna, I just want to comment on, on, on some of this because I think it's important. I mean, we do have the experience with this, and I think it's important to manage to, uh, yeah, to fulfill your comments. So most of these patients are going to require an empty abdomen. Like they're all going to, like if, you're go if you need, if you need, uh, clearance, solid clearance. You have to have their abdominal cavity in entirely practically evacuated, right? So what happens after that is if you're doing exchanges, if you're doing solid uh, clearance, uh, you're going to be draining your cites and whatever you're putting in with your UF. You're getting up from the UF with your actual dial. That's, that's if you're going to do any PD and ultrafiltration. But actually, it, once you start, uh, you know, if you have a large volume of cites, you're actually preload reducing that patient by ultrafiltration just by evacuating that fluid. Because as you're removing it from the abdominal cavity, you're gonna have redistribution there from you know, your blood space, and what you're doing is ultrafiltrating the patient. So you do it slowly to not get them hypotensive. Um, you decide how much fluid balance you, negative you're gonna decide for a given day, and that's gonna be dependent on their, their you know, creatinine and, and, and their blood pressure, et cetera. And then at some point, you'll, you'll see a couple of scenarios. So you, you have you know, the, the cardiorenal patients will either do one of two things. One is that they'll get dramatically better because their startling curve um, has, and they start getting better cardiac output and their blood pressure stays solid. Their creatinine actually comes down and, or, or stays where it's at, but often come down actually to practically normal values. Or you have those people who are so decompensated that the startling curve isn't gonna do anything and then they get hypotensive and they run around with blood pressures of 70 or 80 yeah. systolic, um, but they still feel great, they're unloaded. And uh, so in those patients, if you don't need to do uh, ultra solid removal, you can just allow them to retain a certain amount of uh, PD uh, um, ascites uh, by just deciding to leave it in there. If on the other hand, you still have to unload them, um, at some point you're gonna have to have them entirely uh, evacuated to do the ultrafiltration you're referring to. So we don't put fluid in a belly that's got ascites fluid right. that's not been fully drained. That's generally how it goes. And you'll see that their uh, diuretic response, once you get them down, the first group will actually start Im improving. They'll respond to the diuretics that they previously weren't having a diuresis with. One more quick question, John. Do you have any experience with off-label icodextrin twice a day, two, two 12-hour exchanges with icodextrin? <laughs> off-label, but uh, I'm just sounding out whether people no, do that. No, I don't. Okay, thanks. Thank you.